wanted them to be comfortable or at least a little messy, like me. Anyone else? Anything that you, oh, I just, um, I made sure that I could get all the way around all of the dust. So I had a group of four and then I moved it to group of two. And then I can actually get all the way around every single dust and get a little closer to the units. So you, that was a positive change for you then, right? Yes. Um, I thought of something right when you said that. Oh, there's a, I have heard it somewhere in time to teach that you shouldn't be more than two seats away from your child because I guess just that physical presence it kind of loses its effect to her on, on back. But right here, they kind of feel like I'm kind of right on top of them. So that's something that I took it out of our presentation only because it didn't seem right. Because now with the way things are arranged, I mean, a lot of times you're still going to be more than two away. But I think how you arrange it and how you meander through, you know, they don't know, they can't, don't do the same pattern every time either. Because they'll catch up on that real quick. I mentioned this last time. Simply creating a more effective classroom design, you can improve your students' performance by 25%. That's kind of that's kind of incredible to me that just by putting the seats out to where they work better, that I can effect, effectively improve their performance just with that. And the stuff we're going to talk about next next class, I believe, which is the teach twos and the exp expectations and. You're going to find out that between that and having an effective classroom, your discipline is going to drop significantly. The reason why we do what we do with the classroom is to promote active learning. When you went to tables of four, you, you, um, you made it easy for yourself to use pairs, quads, right? If you needed to bring them together into a bigger group, you could do that. I mean, you, you've allowed yourself a lot of freedom and flexibility in how to reach your kids. And even though as a teacher, it's kind of a pain in the butt to constantly have to make sure the kids put their back, chairs back so that it fits right and all that kind of stuff, the, what you're getting out of it is significant because they're never bored in that regard. Like if you're like, okay, right now you're gonna do a pair share and then the next activity, as a group, you know, you're gonna put this poster together. You're constantly changing it up. And you're changing who they dialogue with, who they work with. I would encourage you to do that, by the way, with the CD charts. I mean, obviously you split up the kids that are the pair from hell, but you can also, I, you can also be more conducive to that child who's really, really shy my first year of teaching, I was at Central High, and um, I taught RSP. I do not have a special ed credential. Um, this was before NCLB, and the principal put me there to punish me, and I loved it. And we paired up with one of the regular ed English classes, which of course is common now, right? They call it, well, I don't know what they call it at all your schools, but we co-teaching. We co-taught before co-teaching was cool. And she was young, Type A, um, hyper. Oh God, she was hyper. And I was me. I'm not Type A. You know, I'm way more laid back. And we put these kids in a class together, and one of my boys was nonverbal, um, head down, wouldn't make eye contact. And we were reading Taming of the Shrew. I'm like, here, it's gonna be lost on my kids, but let's see what happens. That little boy that wouldn't even look up was reading out of Shakespeare beautifully. And it was such a huge, such a huge accomplishment because we didn't isolate them, we intermixed them. And you know, while that may not have been perfect for every child, it was definitely a good move for most of them. And it was, it ended up being such a huge thing for, he was the most dramatic, obviously, improvement that we saw, but it was one of those things where how you control that classroom can really bring some kids out of their shell or their fear. Appropriate technology, that's kind of a, that's up to your school, whether you have what you need, and space. 
Did any of you move your classroom after we talked the first time? Yeah. Did you, do you find that it helped? Yeah. Yeah? Excellent. Anyone else? Nobody moved anything? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had my desk set up in diamonds, and so I moved them more into squares, so that gave me a lot more freedom. Uh -huh. um, I also, from the article, read that it's good to have movement and like have a meeting area. Um, so I kind of shaped them, my pods in a U, so now I have the middle of my classroom, and I was able to kind of bring them in for math, oh, cool. like to be really up close to the board and easy access to them to write on my board. So, so that was a good move for you. Yeah. Awesome. You. Well, yeah, I, I have groups too, um, and I decided it was creating a little too much chit chat, um, and also I wasn't able to move between the desks as well, so. I did also kind of a U shape, um, but because I have so many kids in my class, I also created groups of three inside the U shape facing me, so kids were still able to turn around and talk to people, but it was much more open. I'm able to get nice. through all the students, and there's multiple means of exiting the classroom space as well. Whereas before, it was very like linear, like the kids could only kind of follow one direction just because it's so crowded. Oh, that's great. I like how you guys are finding creative ways. It's not just what you get out of that packet or anything it's it's creative i i was never everything had to be linear to me not my groups but if they had a group before i needed it to be linear i wish i could have been strong enough to do the diamonds or you know a, a trio for some reason that was the one thing i cared about so at your tables we're going to give you guys a couple minutes talk about what in your classroom design is working what's good and we'll give you some time to chat about that. Yeah, I'm 
You're also t changing their physical mm -hmm. space, which of course is going to keep their brain going. Different partners than they have on their seats, so they get to talk to other people. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Great job. Anybody else? So, I hope you get something from that when you're talking to other people. I know that when when I went to conferences, I loved the part where we could just swap ideas or just even talking to somebody who's in the same struggle or whatever that I was in. So we're trying to make sure you guys get more of that than we did in the past. Um, looking at the comments from last class, we made four, three, four, four groups for you to come and just kind of throw ideas about. You have to choose one though, okay? So over here we have motivating students to write. And then that one is motivating students. So Steve's kind of going to do those together. And you guys are generating the ideas. but And then this one right here will be children needing additional support. Um, the squirrely kid. The kid that just doesn't do what you need him to do. Probably sweet as everything, but they just can't follow instructions. And then that one is dealing with kids who suffer from like anxiety and depression. And the reason 
that came up as somebody had mentioned fidget spinners. And I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and that's what that group will be. So you can either go to that, that, that table, this table, or the two over there are motivating, basically, the motivating terms. Um, you guys can leave your stuff. Nobody will touch it. We're just going to this area. Okay? Okay, ready to break it. administration's given you whatever you can to help one another because ideally we'd like to see you guys consider each other a resource right and so when you guys get together like that everybody's going to have treated that type of child probably a million different ways so for you guys to come up with some ideas have somebody write them down as ideas and then we're going to talk about it real quick when you're done so we should just be filling up the, the post with board with ideas about children yeah. And then you guys on your own. So this one is. The reason why this one's kind of is because uh, well, my partner is. Cool and so she sees a lot of this kind of stuff. And, um, and then her daughter is a teenager, senior. And um, the anxiety stuff has sense. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And one of the things I learned about is I talked about You know, because it would seem like it was a horrible distraction. But the only thing I could think of is I shake my knee when I'm right? And if I'm not bothering anybody, my thing is, how do they care? With this, in the fitness center, there are things that they can do that aren't going to be. Right? It doesn't have to be this good. Um, so I wanted you guys to think about how you address it. Do you allow them? Should you allow them? Um, what are some, you know, uh, some moves you can make to make sure that that child is going to get met? <laughs> they do have that um, tape. It's almost like the back side of the Yes. And the kids, it's a touch thing. They can just sit there and touch it and it calms them down. And then like, um, for some of them, just having that like clay, like for a stress ball or anything like that can also for us, bring um, their anxiety down, means, which I, I know the, the piece of my, so my you know, well, drive is crazy for what they're using, but I'll the opposite of them the not day. having it and then just shutting down and perhaps like, causing a huge deal is it really that? I mean, minor, you know, minor typical. So, it's crazy. I've never. You did a whole week, you did two weeks. Like, I never, um, I've never seen it. Like, and at first, I was a little patient. I was in the whole class today. And I was like, oh, well, that's my first instinct. So we all got the same thing. But then I started realizing that she literally goes to another party. So she is so off-wall. You know, she had the five old four but she had a meeting her day and teacher who compliments and she's a great teacher and she's a very strong personality. So then I told her that like, hey, even the best of us guys are in never dealt with kids at this extreme. And unless we were in special ed, you know, you don't really forget those kids on the day. But right now we do because they're all such an awesome form of PTSD. And so the IEP and stuff, I think even you teach them that they need to listen. It's like really a Then I said, okay. So they can try, but and this is like a whole different. Those are positive. I can't even get my head around it, and I'm like, and the others 
Though you're negative about how that child, she's having today. Major issues. If you have more positive than the teachers just don't understand that. Like that. So it was, it was nice to see how it works um, and just kind of um, externalizing an internal skill uh, within the culture. Right? What was that like? Completely understand how it's affecting you, but here are three things you and I can do together. 
lot of the people who don't wear that. Instead, it's black and white. And she automatically sends us the worst option. So you don't you don't want them thinking that either. Because this isn't our dog's concern. So we need to teach them how to self regulate, how to get through this horrible anxiety that they're going through. or the depression or the PTSD or whatever it is called. We pretty much all of them are going through PTSD. Some version of it. And I never even really thought about how, I mean, I know how much it's affecting all my kids. Oh, actually, it's like, it's really nice. You know, most kids, they want to be home, but our kids just don't. It's like an imposter. They have a just yeah. amount of people. They want to be in school because they really don't be there. And I made a whole math game. And I know their friends will be there. And they can get down with their parents. I didn't make an incentive chart for me. So you're more of a, 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 you it's not just the school and the symptoms follow a direction. I can't sit still. They can give him a word of advice to do any of these things outside. But he'll go on to and do like two seconds of it and then be off around the room. And I can I can set it up with, hey, if I see you doing X, Y, Z, or some of the things you can do, tell him more. What kind of a room you're in, you don't have to get by him. I don't even have that feeling. I don't even have that feeling. Yes, you're right. To show them because like he can't, that. Like, you know, he can't even begin to do it. So, so social what kind of a choice type like like thing would you do? I mean, it's instant. And I, I, have to, I just don't know what's going on. I don't know if that question belongs here. No, it does. What I need to be thinking about is video games. Are you scanning a PDF reward? Are you sitting down? And so, with a kid that is like that, they're not going to be able to do it. You know, they're not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to do it. They're not going to be able to do it. Probably a kid in the house at home, and dad says, or mom, or whatever. Right? Oh my god. Yeah. So my video game. I think so. Yeah, it's like it's getting yeah, yeah, rewarded by a meeting of kids that got the case, and they're all having to learn. I always get kind of bad management's behavior. Right. Maybe something like, what do you talk about? The check mark? I mean, what kind of options could I give him? Thank you. We used to have, like, um, Okay, kids, we're almost done. Well, that was just what kind of a choice. I think we had in high school. We just know something like this. Okay, so are you ready to do your homework? 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 Yeah. 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 He likes to talk. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I had really social. That's because I've had it, I've given him jobs and everything, and he does. Not only loves, and he does. And he does. And he does. And he loves to play. And he never told me that. And it's not like he's thinking about what he's doing. It's poker. Oh, there it is. I know that when I was in school, I didn't get so many tricks. Because I wouldn't get so many tricks. It's like a child. It's like a friend. They're intertwined. I can't believe that. This is high school kids, so I mean, yeah. I did work with them for a very long time. But um, I know with my not work, the kids that have such a bad reputation, um, I would call home. 
like I pretend like I saw something. It didn't matter if it was legit or not. Big brother, big sister. And you call home and you tell them, yeah, I'm just calling because so and so and so. And immediately the parents expect me to call to be angry, right? And so I have a call, and a lot of them made it up, like I said. But I would call and say, hey, I want you to know how much I enjoy them. And remember that you lied to my team. It doesn't matter. That parent is like, right then you have an ally. Yeah, I've already done that one. Yeah, and then. And then the kid, you know, if some mom says, you can see the kid going, what are you now? Oh no, they said you were great. And you know, I realize that's not going to solve everything. But it changes the child's view of you and what you're really, your intent is or her. So I would, just, I would do that and I would try to find out. Yeah, I am that. Because I like the confession of being good, too. Like, I'm trying to get you not being good. Well, even if you don't see it, make it up. Because he'll start feeding out like <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Some parents, I guess, signed up and they're not report card is yeah, yeah. 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 Like if they're if you so so over to caught you, caught you being good, you know, you're doing great. I had a kid who when I first started teaching Avid, if you're familiar with Avid, and um we we started our district and we unified very much like we're unified, so very diverse. And I had this group of kids sitting there. And I sent three people out at Summer Institute, which is some of the best institutes you could ever go to. Yeah, but they had told me how like hard it was going to be and how exhausted you'd be. And I thought, man, I was a coach. Oh my God. And I was drowning that first year. Drowning. And that wasn't my first year of teaching. That was like my second year of teaching. And um, I'm looking around at this group because I was thinking that there'll be a family. And I'm looking at these kids. And you know, I had the, the goofy Aggie kid. Um, not because she was Aggie, because she was the anti woman Aggie. Um, and then, you know, like the gangbanger wannabe. I had a lot I'm sitting there looking at them, and I'm like, no way these kids are going to be the same. Like, they are too different. Just no way. But I stood up there and I said, you know, you guys know why you're in here? Because you're smart. And they wanted to give you that opportunity to show everybody how smart you are. And in my head, I'm thinking, I don't even believe this right now. But awesome, right? I keep saying it, keep saying it. Every one of those kids got accepted to a fourth grade university. Every one of them. And they didn't all go. But the point is, they did get to the point where they could have gone. And um, I, I wish I had done like a, a study. Because the way they changed how they felt about themselves and how they felt about each other was pretty powerful. And I didn't know if it was But I said, I'm told them. How great they were. And I didn't know if it was going to work. I mean, it's not like I had this brilliant master I think everyone yeah, I told them that like I I and I swear they were just <laughs> 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 uh, I want to stop that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then another thing I was I think because he wants to be in the because so I had a lot of class. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of class. 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 What happened that made them think that that wasn't for them? We're sitting here now. We're sitting here now. And that's where we 
you know, whether we like it or not, we have to make expectations on every family forward. The fact that it really makes sense in this presentation, because now it's arrived on the tail of somebody who already heard the song, um, there's a lot of consistency, and it's, uh, it's uncontrollable consistency. We don't have control. Do you want me to put an insight? Insight? I'm not going to throw that out. I'm not going to throw that out. I'm not going to throw that out. They just want somebody to see the good. Even the worst, worst kid. You know, um, can you guys hang up your posters real quick? I guess over here on the front of our... And you can go back to your seat. You just threw the whole thing out. I like to hear a lot of people. And now I'm nervous. The pressure was on. For some reason, this paper... It's making it right. I love it. I don't know. No one's going to count. I'm going to count. Five minute break. So Mike and I talk together. It's a reminder. It's a good one. Yeah, 
chance to sit down and he hears boom boom oh my gosh so he comes running back making sure he's okay because I'm like, wow and he, he crests the hill and he sees a man arguing and his wife pointing the gun at the man and the guy's got his hands up and he says ma'am it's your elk just let me take my saddle off first <laughs> Oh, touch all the people too. Wow, that was oh, God. <laughs> so sad. 
All right. Stay calm. Tonight, I want you to write this down. Anywhere you want, on your hand, on your neighbor's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Emotions are contagious. Emotions are contagious. Emotions are contagious. I'm going to tell you something that's not even on the script tonight. If something is messing with your emotions outside of class, you are going to bring them into class. Your man proposed to you last night, you're all happy, you got the ring, you're all giddy, you come to class, guess what's going to happen to your class? They're going to be all squirrely and giddy and excited. Car got broken into Sunday night and you have to go to class Monday with no windows and it's starting to rain. You're going to be mad and upset. You will bring those emotions to the class. They're contagious and your class will start to be irritated. Have you ever noticed kids on a windy day? What happens on a windy day? Right? Fortunately, it was windy yesterday and not today, but for whatever reason, it stirs them up. I don't know if I believe in it or not, but there's something to be said about a full moon. How about this? The day before a holiday. Not Christmas because it's the end of the semester and you've already goofed off for a whole week. But Veterans Day is coming. And what is your emotion? Oh, I can't wait to get out of this class. And you can't get your kids to work. November 1st. November 1st? What's November 1st? Halloween. The day after Halloween. Halloween's on a Sunday. Halloween's on a Sunday, so they're going to be all wired with candy, right? And tired, because they were up too late. Right? All right. Now, what if in your class a student can make you angry? Is it possible for a student to get under your skin? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, it happens. Because you know what happens is you say this. My class would be better if so and so wasn't here. And sure enough, they're absent for three days, and the class is great. And then they come back, and you're like, ugh. Thank God for these masks, because they mask a lot of the other <laughs> So, emotions are contagious. When you get upset, your life is in the hands of anyone that can make you upset. They control you. We're going to talk about that today. Why? When we're talking about a student that's causing problems or even back-talking you, and they're getting under your skin, and you reply, you just started the melodrama. How many people does it take to be in a melodrama? At least two, right? But if you remain quiet and calm, now it's a one-man act. And pretty soon they're going to run out of steam. I'm going to tell you something that seems totally counterintuitive. Not always, but sometimes it's best to just let it go and deal with it when you go to recess or your class is being dismissed for next period or lunchtime or at the end of school and you pull that student aside and then you have a talk. Why? It doesn't matter what their background is or how old they are. This is K-12. It's a, actually, it works with adults as well. Nobody likes to lose face in front of their friends. Nobody. And if you're putting a student down in front of their friends, it's going to cause them to get really defensive and really agitated and pour the gas on. Some of you were that student. Would you like to get underneath the skin of a teacher and provoke them and see if you can get them off track just because it was entertaining? 
right? Not all of y'all. What we've discovered about teachers is that you are probably the ones that overachieve. And you like school so much you wanted to keep going. <laughs> Not me. I was a class clown. I was always goofing around. Uh, and it wasn't, one of the things that we know is that students that struggle with academics, they don't even know they have a strategy, but they use a strategy of being misbehaving in the class clown so they don't have to read in class, so they don't have to answer the question. Okay? I was the, on the other end of the stick. Uh, we were talking about motivation over here a moment ago. I was the one that was bored. And I would entertain myself by goofing around, by doing things I shouldn't do, right? And we want to help you with, with some of that. So we talked about our um, motivation over here, and we looked at our list, and two things really popped out of our list. According to national research, when we're motivating students both for behavior and for academics, the number one key ingredient is the relationship between the students and the teacher. And I said, it's not about the student liking the teacher, it's about the student respecting the teacher. Eventually, if the student respects you, they'll like you. But they may not like you right now because you're making them work. But if they respect you, particularly if they know you care deeply about them, they'll run through a brick wall for you. According to national data, it is the number one indicator for student success. The relationship between a student and a teacher. What I'm telling you is, love your kids in an appropriate way. Let them know that you care. You don't have to use the word, I love you. I care about you, I'm concerned about you, I'm worried about you, I want the best for you. I care more about your graduation rate than I do. I care more about your grades than you do. Whatever you want to say, it's the number one thing. Number two, we talked about connecting students with their interests, right? And so we're talking about some writing things, and my student just wants to do the bare minimum, check the box, and turn it in. And I thought to myself, yeah, I've got the same problem with my Nick teachers. <laughs> I do. But if we get something that's interesting to the student, they'll go off, right? Okay, so that's, that's, those are two things we've got here. What have we got here? I don't even know what this book is for. Uh, so we broke it down into two categories, uh, left side we tools and right side we resources. So what was your question? What was your concern? Um, ours was anxiety and depression. Ah, uh, anxiety tools, and depression, okay. The tools we can use in the classroom on the left side broken down into, uh, I guess, primary and secondary. And on the right side, we have the resources to deal with anxiety and depression that are outside of our control, provided more on either involvement from school psychologists, um, counselors, and we decided a, a big brother, big sister. I know at Liberty High School, we do a girl and girl, which we have our high school girls and for our middle school girls. Nice. Uh, what, what they talk about, I'm not really sure. It's only the girls only club. So, but you can definitely do that in your own classroom where you could create the topic themselves. Um, here are the top, talking topics. Have about two, three people in the class, boys or girls, and then put them off. One in boys, one in girls, and you just stand right in the middle and just let them talk. Right. Most of the time, both will, so most of them will share out loud and eventually it will turn into a big old cry fest or or not, who knows? But you just gotta give them the chance to talk. Uh, that's one of the things we did. I don't know if we talked about it. That's good. Okay. One of the things I saw um, from a teacher, I don't hate this too. Um, last year in Zoom was that he had 38 breakout rooms, 38 students. And he went from room to room to room to room to room. The first question he asked is, how you doing? Now, at first it sounds like a greeting. How you doing? I'm doing all right. But he knew, and they knew, they didn't have a lot of time for chit-chatting, but he knew, that the kids knew, he is really asking me, how am I doing? And I listened to some of the kids who really kind of 
say, this is what's going on. This is not. But I thought about how do we check in with students now on an individual basis? How do we make that connection? I have a flip chart. You have a flip chart? A clip chart, a clip chart. Each kid has a clothespin with their number on it in the classroom, and every morning when they walk in, they put their clip on a piece of paper that says how they're doing. I'm great, I'm good, I'm men, I'm struggling, I'm not doing okay, and I would appreciate a check-in, or I'm not okay, and I need to be talked to. Nice. My uh, thought would be to make a personal connection with each student and know something specific about them, right? How was the football game Friday night? How, do, how is your brother doing? I know he was uh, sick the other day. You were having a babysitter, right? Making that connection. The other thing we did uh, really well last year, we're at Washington, I got a couple Washington student teachers, yeah? They were doing home visits with the food. So parents couldn't get the meal because we were doing a whole Wednesday, well, and they were going home and check and well, while you're there, how's it going? What are we doing? Is there anything else you need? And I, and I wanted to think, these are things that we should be doing even outside of a Zoom classroom. How do we make that connection and would it help with the social and emotional and would it matter what grade they're in, right? And does it add to the relationship factor when we're talking about teacher to student? I really care about you. In fact, I know something about you. I know you played soccer at Novi on Saturday. How did you do, right? Good. All right, and then over here we have, what was this topic? Child needing additional support. Needing additional support. What did we come up with over here? So one of the things we talked about was just um, kind of grouping students up. We talked about grouping like all the low students together. That way like and the high students can work on stuff independently, whereas the low students you're able to kind of spend more time with touching base with more. We also talked the opposite of that. We talked about pairing up the high with the low students, so that way there's like strategic partnering, and uh, kind of the higher student could help the lower student. We also said that kind of at the beginning, regardless of when you have your you have a child needing additional support, there is there should be parent communication. So whether that's just a phone call to let them know what's happening or cost to check in day in and day out. And the other stuff we talked about was just really incentives for the, them to controlling their own behavior and even specific things, such so as like choice boards. Good, good. Well, choice seems to be a theme this year. Lots of choices for what we talked about and even over here. Okay, good. Can I jump in? Okay. Um, don't underestimate even the tiniest effort you make with kids. Um, I was teaching English over at Central uh, Central East, and I had a kid that was a total, whether he was a wannabe or he was in it, he was a gangbanger. And he never would look up, you know how they are, and the eyes down. And and one day I just kind of went by and I said, you doing okay? And he barely looked up, but he looked up, nodded his head, and that was the end of it. And um, <laughs> apparently he heard me on the phone at one point talking about my truck and like apparently the fact that I didn't want to pay for it anymore. And um, <laughs> he, he waited until everybody had left one day, and I thought, oh my god, this kid's going to kill me. <laughs> and he shut the door, and I'm like, oh god. And he said, Miss Taylor, do you have good insurance? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, where's this going? He said, well, I can take care of your truck for you if you want me to. <laughs> and I kind of went, and it dawned on me. He was going to take it out to Kearney and burn it for me so I could get the insurance money. And, <laughs> as, you know, and here I am, the kid didn't even like me, and he's making, I mean, in his world, that was a big deal, right? And then when I turned him down for burning my car, he worked at a car wash, so he brought me a stack of um, cards for free car washes. So. But it was so cute because I never really had a conversation with this child or anything, but just the fact, I think, that I made eye contact with him one day and I wasn't afraid or whatever. You just don't know. So it's totally worth it. All right. When a student, when you get agitated, when you have unmet expectations, when things happen, your body has a reaction. Fight, flight, and actually you can even say freeze. So what happens? You're thinking in a part of your brain called the neocortex. When you get under stress, your thinking switches to 
your reptilian brainstem part of your brain, where you just react. Have you ever been in an interview, and then 20 minutes later as you're driving home, you go, oh, I should have said. <laughs> right? That's because you were under stress. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody you care about, and two hours later, you go, and another thing. You couldn't say it at the time because your brain was under stress. Now, what happens if you're in a classroom with 30 other students and you're in that state of mind where you're just reacting? Can you think logically? No. No. And so we go back to our original slide. Who's in control? The students are in control of you. So how do we avoid that? We have to learn how to remain calm so that we can stay in our uh, state of mind where we can think. By the way, when you're in a fight flight reflex, your body begins to generate a hormone from your adrenal glands that gets you all jacked up. And your muscles tense and your digestion stops, and your pupils get dilated. Have you ever gone home and all of your muscles up here are just kind of like, ah, uh, stiff? Or 30 minutes after the last what bell is rung at the end of the day, you feel like you haven't slept in a year, and you're so tired you can barely drive home? That's because your day has been stressed the whole time, and you're now finally beginning to relax. The adrenaline is going away. So how do we remain calm? We have a lot more to tell you than just being calm, but tonight that's what we're going to talk about. But the other thought is, if your kids are working and you aren't, that's a Harry Long kind of technique, right? Get the kids to work, I'm going to watch them work, instead of 38 kids watching me work. So we flip the script. We'll talk about that in another session. Tonight, we're going to talk about remaining calm. Calm is contagious. Calm is contagious. It's an emotion. All right. Wait. the difference between danger and stress. Our brain from danger. But our brain can't always tell the difference between danger and stress. When your brain is really stressed and thinks you're in danger, it responds by trying to help you stay safe. This is your fight, flight, freeze, and fawn response. So, if a bear wanted to eat you, you might fight the bear, run away from the bear, that's flight, freeze and hope it doesn't see you, that's your hiding response, or fawn, which is kind of like trying to convince the bear not to eat you, or sometimes being really cute, like a cute little puppy with big eyes. So what does this have to do with anxiety? Anxiety is complex. So we're making it simple by talking about three parts of your brain that are involved in this stress response. The first part is your brainstem, or your survival brain. Your survival brain is responsible for your body. Things like your breath, your heart rate, movement and exercise, your sleep, and the list goes on. Basically, the stuff that helps you stay alive. The second part is your limbic system, or your emotional brain. It's responsible for your emotions. <laughs> Duh. The third part of your brain is your frontal lobe. It's responsible for higher functioning thinking, 
Stuff like reading, writing, communicating, and solving problems. When you're stressed and your brain thinks you're in danger, it triggers the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response by sending extra energy to your survival brain and body so you can be fast and strong or run away and fight danger. And sending extra energy to your emotional brain because emotions help us decide the best way to respond. All that extra energy has to come from somewhere. Your smart brain goes temporarily offline because if a bear was about to eat you, you wouldn't need to know how to do algebra or speak French. So this means that energy can be redirected to your survival and emotional brain. Temporarily, of course. The good news is once you're safe and calm down, everything in your brain returns to normal. We live in a world that's full of stress. So stuff like homework or fighting with friends can still trigger our fight, flight, freeze or fawn response. Like if you had some stressful homework to do, you might get angry and irritable. That's your fight response. You might feel panicked. That's your flight response. You might procrastinate or avoid it. That's your freeze response. Or you might try to talk your way out of having to do it, either to someone else or in your head. And that is your fawn response. The good news is there are some brain hacks that can help you to calm down. Brain hack number one. If you can calm down your body, this can help you calm down your brainstem or survival brain. You can do this by doing things with your body. You might use your breath, go for a run, or have a shower. Brain hack number two. If you can calm down your thoughts, you can calm down your limbic system or emotional brain. You can do this by doing things with your thoughts, like visualizations, meditation, and mindfulness. Brain hack number three. Turn your frontal lobe, or smart brain, back on. You can do this by doing things your smart brain is good at, like talking to a counsellor, reading a book, or writing your thoughts down. Calming yourself down takes practice. To get really good at managing stress, you have to practice a lot of times in order to grow the brain cells, connect them together, and create a whole new pathway in your brain. But the more you practice, the stronger the pathway gets until it becomes easier or even automatic. Is there ever going to be a time when you want to wear these silly things? All right. How is the fight, flight, reflex related to stress? Talk about that in one minute in your table group. How is the fight, flight, reflex related to stress? when it comes to like six, seven, it's like, 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 Time. All right. How? I just had to get cases of the wall for a second. 
How is the fight flight reflex related to stress? Let's hear from the back table. Anyone come up with insights? Uh, we said that stress triggers the fight or flight reflex. Very good. Is that basically what y'all said? Okay. She said that stress triggers the fight flight reflex. Now, you have, I don't want to use the word microaggressions, but you have little bitty stressors all day long, right? You're teaching a lesson, and it's really important. You just got the kids calm down, and the damn phone goes off. And you send so and so to the office, right? You're in junior high math, in the middle of a quiz, it's been a tough day already, and Charlie farts. <laughs> you love that kid. <laughs> These things happen all the time when or or when a student back talks to you, right? You're hurrying. Um, I want to make that my students right, and I hear, oh, right? And you're like, gosh. Oh. But a student can say some very rude things. Up to and including the F word. And our natural reaction, by the way, when we hear somebody say, F you, you're out of here. Which may be the very thing that student wanted. We want to see if there's a way to de-escalate that and deal with it in your classroom while remaining calm and helping that student realize through some positive uh, behavioral um, strategies, through some uh, uh, restorative justice, through we have some other things. I mean, there's so many things I'm excited about for you to get. I wish we could just lay it out in one night. But Jenny's going to talk about a time to refocus in the classroom when we're not sitting the student outside, even when we are so agitated because the kid just flipped us off or told us something that we should never, ever hear in our own classroom. Good. What is downshifting and how does it account for us saying and doing things that we later have to apologize for? One minute in your group, that's where you, your brain goes from the neocortex into the brain stem and you're just reacting. What is it? You have one minute. Go. Until they're 25 or 30 years old. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm just being real here. Oh, All right. So I told you an induction orientation that I believed that there was people that looked through a window and looked through a mirror and wanted you to be reflective. I gave you my own personal story and I told you that when I get excitable, I need to be quietable because I will say things I don't ever want to ever come out of my mouth, and once they're out, they can never come back. 
So this works with our spouses and loved ones, as well as with our students. We need to remain calm. It's not the student's backtop that gets kids kicked out of class. It's the teacher backtop that gets a student kicked out of class. You start laying into a student, you use the old time strategy that we all kind of go back to called nagging. And we say, Brian, if I have to come over there one more time, and Brian says, what? I wasn't doing anything. And so now I'm agitated, and I come over to Brian. Brian, you will sit down and do your work. I'm not doing this crap, blah, 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 right? And what we're doing is provoking him. We're playing the two roles of the melodrama. And all of a sudden, I said, Brian, I've had enough. Go to security. We could have avoided that whole thing if I would have remained calm and kept my mouth shut. Is it next week that we're learning um, to move in and in, in proximity? No, no, well, you're doing the Victoria one today. Right, but, that, but the move in is later. Yeah. We're going to teach you how to move. We talked, we demonstrated last week, but in a couple weeks, we're going to have you actually stand up and move in. And it eliminates a whole bunch of stuff because I'm not going to say anything, even though she might still be back talking to me. But she's already uncomfortable because I'm in her space. And we've got COVID protocols going on, and she's going, What the heck is going on? <laughs> but you notice how her body reached up when I walked over? She sat up a little bit. She's looking at me like, What do you want? I didn't have to say a thing, did I? Brian would know why I'm standing here. Especially if I moved in a calm manner. We're going to practice that tonight. Alright. Calm is strength and upset is weakness. Can you be in control of a situation without first being in control of yourself? This time I'm giving you 30 seconds. Talk about it at your table. Go. Oh, can you control a class if you yourself are out of control no hey you know what all you have to do is youtube teachers out of control because guess what kids are going to do when you lose it three jobs i have three jobs one is mick one is for our pre um, pip stips and interns and a third job that I have is called Peer Assistance and Review. For some teachers, it's just I need some more help. No problem, we call it voluntary PAR. For other teachers, their evaluation <coughs> is bad, and they're put in mandatory PAR, and I have to go and meet with them and try to figure out how to help them get out of the situation. Ten years of experience of, looking, of beginning to know teachers that are really, really struggling some we have fired. Some have gone away and we were happy about. One teacher shoved a student while they were sitting in a seat out the door with the whole entire desk. Shouting matches, shoving matches, cussing contests between the teachers and the students. These things happen. And you're like looking at me, oh my God, really? Yes. Why? Because, for one, the teacher has so much crap going on in their lives outside of the class, they have no more capacity to deal with any more problems when they come to work. And then they get all this, this uh, irritation and stress and provoking, provocation. Pro Thank you. <laughs> they blow up. And we sometimes just automatically, those, some of those are just automatically dismissed. You touch a kid, you're gone. There's a couple of things, by the way, did you know that you will automatically be fired for? Anything that's sexual. Physically contacting a student. 
not touching but contacting. You know the difference you know, when you're shoving a student or you're, you're trying to hold a student, right? And you're not trained for it, right? Stealing. Those three things alone will get you fired like that. What was the last thing? Stealing. stealing. Oh, stealing. stealing. Other things take more time and we work through the process, but if you shove a student, if you sexually assault or sexually engage with the student, or you steal, you're done. Okay. Last one, the fight flight reflex is quick, powerful, and natural. How can you abort the flight reflex before downshift into your brainstem? By remaining what? Calm. Calm, let's practice that. Okay, I want you to turn to somebody and make sure that you're partnered up. You may have to change tables, but I want you to have a partner. I want you to turn your chairs toward each other. They need to face each other. Does anybody not have a partner? Anybody not have a partner? Good. Okay. Now, I need your cooperation. I need your cooperation. You got to be quiet. <laughs> All right, so here's what I want you to do. Put, put your feet flat on the floor, put your hands on your lap. Okay, first we need to feel what it feels like to be calm. So I want you to tense all your muscles, tense your shoulders, tense your arms, tense your, your, your abdomen, tense your thighs, tense your calves. Calmly breathe out and relax. Don't go to sleep on me. Let's do that again. So tense up, feeling the neck muscles, your shoulder muscles, your arms, your abdomen, your thighs, and your calves. And release and exhale. And be calm. All right, we have masks on, so it's going to be harder to do. You should be facing, oh, you're facing her. Sorry. So, one of the things that can give away, whether you're irritated or not, are your facial expressions, even with the mask on. And I can never play poker because I wear my emotions on my street, on my sleeve. And I, people can tell when I'm upset, and I forget sometimes to remain calm and do this one technique. What I want you to do is look at your partner and grind your teeth. What kind of a look is that? All right. Three, two, one. Okay. Now I want you to practice something else. I want you to put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and keep your mouth closed mm -hmm. and see if your partner can discern what you're thinking. <laughs> Go. <laughs> when you put your tongue when you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, it causes your face to relax because it relaxes the jaw muscles. Slowly breathe in, breathe out. All right. And now I want you to find a focal point on your partner. Probably the space between their eyebrows, one, maybe one inch above, right on their forehead. So that you're engaged. All right. No talking, no talking. Gotta be quiet. Alright. Chins up. Shoulders. Arms. Abdomen. Thighs. Calves. Relax. Check your jaw by putting your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Find your focal point. Now you're being calm. 
Okay, stop. Okay, here's the deal. Here's where we're headed. What we need to be able to do is not convey any emotion at all. A kid tells you a joke, you don't laugh. A kid pisses you off, you don't react. You're trying to be the Queen Victoria who's giving the look of, I am not amused. I really don't care what you're doing. We need to get back to work. So you're not angry. That's important. And you're not laughing with your students. What happens, seventh grade teachers, if you start laughing in class with your students? You're done, right? I might go and laugh with my seniors for a few minutes and then get back to work. But in seventh grade, forget about it. I walked into a class one time. She was teaching sixth grade. And I, I don't think of myself as being a scary person or an intimidator or whatever. But as soon as I walked in, I made her nervous. I didn't even know that until I started watching her lesson unfold. And she started teaching, and she had a PowerPoint, and they were doing math. And by the way, she wanted to be a kindergarten teacher, so she didn't have to teach sixth grade math. I didn't know that either. But I walked in, and sure as a world, because I made her nervous, she started getting the giggles. So she started giggling, and so because that was her outlet for, you know, ever have a nervous laughter? Well, the students who started getting goofy, and they started, and that made her nervous because I'm in there to see what she's doing, and the class is laughing. And then she messed up on her presentation. She taught two slides ahead. It didn't match what she was teaching. And then she turned the slide. And then she said, oh, forget everything I just said. And she started all over. Sweat starting to pour down the poor girl. She's starting to giggle louder. The class, and I'm like, OK, I got to get out. <laughs> because this, this, I realize now that my presence is causing her to be nervous. And the class picked up on that. right? So we want you to be able to separate what you're feeling with what you're expressing with your body language. So, right now I need you to pick an A and a B between your two partners. Somebody needs to be A, and somebody needs to be B. Now, it's gonna be a little easier with your masks on but what we're gonna do in a moment, you cannot say any words. A's, you're gonna to try to make the B's laugh. But you can't say anything with no words. A's, you're gonna to try to make the B's laugh. So B's, I want you sitting straight in your chair, hands on your lap. I want you to check your jaw and find your focal point. Breathe in. Breathe out, remaining calm. A's, I want to see if you can make him laugh. Go. No talking, no talking, no words. No words. There's a lot of words. All right, all right, all right. Hello. Less control. All right. That didn't work so well. And you have masks on. Where you can crack a smile and we wouldn't even know. But y'all started laughing. You can't do that. You got to keep remaining calm. Check your jaw. Look for their focal points. Breathe in. Breathe out. And think these words. I am not amused. <laughs> I'm not amused. A, you're going to do it again. You're going to try to make these laugh. B's in your chairs with your hands in your lap. Find your focal point. Check your jaw. Breathe in. Breathe out. Calm. Go. <laughs> Stop. 
guys. I know this seems really goofy. I realize that it feels silly. But if you can hold it together tonight, You'll be able to do it with your students tomorrow. I'll try it with parenting later. There you go. It works. Switch roles. These are going to make the games laugh. So they're not allowed to talk to get us to laugh? No. Oh, you can do it without having to say anything. You can move. We have a dance over here. And she was good for about six seconds, and then she lost it. All right. So, sitting in your chair upright, hands on your laps. Find your focal point. Check your jaw. Breathe in. Breathe out. Make them laugh. something, doesn't it? So we want to have a look of neutrality. I have no emotion. Is that, am I irritated? You don't know. By the way, being unpredictable when a kid is off task is the best thing you can be. Being unpredictable when they are expecting you to react and you don't uh-oh, now what? Right? Okay, so here's what we're going to practice. We're going to practice a turn. And we learn to stay calm. We're not going to move in tonight, uh, but we are going to learn how to turn. So, 
let's imagine that won't tell me I'm over here helping Mark. And I hear Danny over there goofing off. Here's what we're going to do. Mark, excuse me. I'm going to take a breath in. I'm going to take a breath out. I'm going to check my jaw. And I'm slowly going to get up. And it should take six seconds for me to turn. Daddy know why I'm looking at him? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if I, if I do this, and Danny's goofing off over there, and I'm helping Mark with something, and I, and I turn like this, does that have a different feel to it? Mm -hmm. being, being rapid, put my hands on my hips, what is that saying? I'm, in, I'm irritated. Now, Danny's like, oh, yeah, I got him. Let's see how far I can take it. Maybe he'll kick me out of class and I can go goof off in the, in the cafeteria or whatever, right? All right, so we're gonna put a palm, we're gonna all do this in a moment. I'll calm down. I'm gonna say, Mark, excuse me. Take a breath in, breath out, check our jaw, and slowly, two, three, four, five, six. We're gonna look at the prompts. All right, so everybody stand up. I want you to put one palm on the desk and turn to the back wall. Listen to me, call out the cadence. You're facing the back wall because you got to be able to turn, right? We're helping Mark. Mark needs lots of help. You hear somebody goofing off. With your palm down, you're actually bent over, right? You say, excuse me, Mark. Take a breath in, take a breath out. Check your jaw and slowly turn towards the problem. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Calm down. And you say, excuse me, Larry. Excuse me, Take a breath in. You take a breath out. You check your jaw. And you slowly turn towards the disturbance. You can't smile. And you can't be mad. You've got to turn all the way around. Why? Do, what is this? So she she didn't fully commit. She's got a hand. And she's looking at, she's looking at the disturbance over here, over her shoulder. What is that communicating? As a teacher, you're saying what? I'm not, I'm not only fully invested in the problem. So that's why you physically have to turn and face the issue. All right, turn back to the wall again. Palms down, you're bent over, you're helping Larry. You hear a disturbance at the front of the class. You check on the disturbance. You turn back to Larry. You say, excuse me, Larry. You take a breath in. You take a breath out. You check your jaw. And you slowly turn towards the disturbance. Slower. Slower. It should take you six seconds. And you're fully committed. Where do your hands go? Mine often go in my pockets. But what if I'm a female wearing a dress and I no longer have pockets? And I try to do that. Right? You only wear dress with pockets. You only wear dress with What does this look like? Okay. Our hands can go behind our back, or on our sides, or crossed in front of us. Those are your three choices. Behind you, at your sides, or crossed in front of you. All right, let's try it again. Face the back. 
This time we're doing it without the prompts. Fully committed, you're bent over, you're helping Larry. You hear a disturbance in front of the class, and go. Very good. All right, have a seat. First kid. First kid. All right. Does it feel silly? <laughs> it does kind of feel a little silly. But here's the proof. Here's the proof. It works. So we can get, especially the kids that are normally not an issue, they're just off task, back on task, without disturbing the class, without nailing the student in front of everybody. By remaining calm, we can get a lot of problems solved just by what we call the Queen Victoria look. What emotion are we trying to convey? No emotion. Why? Because emotions are contagious. Emotions are contagious. Yes? What if they're not looking at you, looking at them? The next step is to move in. Okay. So, and that's a whole other night. Right? So we're going to turn, and that's not working. So calmly, I have a problem. With, uh, my daughter tells me this all the time. I walk really fast, right? So if you're the problem, <laughs> <laughs> what did I just convey with that movement? I am really hot. I don't know if I'm hot. I'm really irritated. I'll let my wife decide if I'm hot. <laughs> All right. But if I move slowly, I might even continue teaching the class, right? Got my tablet, my wireless mouse, or whatever. And now all of a sudden, I'm still teaching the class. And I'm walking back here. And you know why I'm walking back here. All of a sudden, the problem is called. And I'm going to tell you, we'll, we'll practice this too. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to walk away. If it escalates or it doesn't stop when it come over, I'm staying in here and we call it camping out. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to get into space by putting my hand on the desk. It takes a lot of guts to keep going at this point. But that didn't work, so now I'm going to elbows. <laughs> Feel uncomfortable? A little bit. She's like, look at her lean. <laughs> <laughs> Do they know why I'm there? Do I have to say anything? No. And as soon as they get back to work, I say thank you. But in this case, because it took so long to calm down, I'm going to stand here for just a few more seconds and watch them get back to work. I'm even going to make sure that their feet are under the table and they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then I'll walk away. What if you get that reaction of, what's up, Mr. T? I don't say a word. By not, by not reacting, I'm surprising them, and that's a scary thing, right? Okay. Yeah, five Questions? Minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Questions? Yeah. Homework. It's in your class already. There's a couple articles we want you to read. Changes that you made in the classroom is one of them. So if you've taken some changes, make some photos. There's another article we want you to read that we put in the homework. It's not on the fly. And there you go. This is on your agenda as well as up here. Would you please take the evaluation? We are reading them. And we are trying to answer your questions. Yes. Just